Hi, everybody, and welcome to Exegetically Speaking, a podcast of the friends and faculty of Wheaton College, Wheaton, Illinois, and the Lanier Theological Library in Houston, Texas. My name is David Capes, and I am the Senior Research Fellow at the Lanier Theological Library and a former dean up there in Wheaton at the School of Biblical and Theological Studies. Our purpose in these podcasts is really very simple. We want to promote the study of biblical languages, Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, so we can read the Bible more faithfully, study it more fully, and not just read it, but to live it. Joining me today on Exegetically Speaking is Dr. Richard Schultz, who's Blanchard Professor of Old Testament at Wheaton College. Dr. Schultz, good to see you. Good to be here. How long have you been at Wheaton College now? It's my 26th year. 26th year. That's right. So you, you, you know where the coffee pot is then, right? I don't drink coffee, but I know where the <laughs> coffee pot is. Well, they haven't they haven't hid it from you or anything like that. No, they don't. Okay, uh, good. even under COVID, they haven't hidden the coffee pot. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're we're glad that you've joined us here for this. We're going to talk about a uh, disputed passage from the book of Isaiah, chapter seven, verse fourteen. Now, some people might immediately begin to say, "Wait a minute, I've heard those numbers before," but set this up for us. What's going on in Isaiah of seven fourteen? Why is it a much disputed text? Well, it's disputed uh, specifically because Matthew chapter 1 quotes it and says that the birth of Jesus from the Virgin Mary was fulfilling the words of the prophet, the virgin will be with child and bring birth, give birth to a son, and they'll call his name Emmanuel, which mm-hmm. means God with us. So the question is whether Matthew's use of this text and applying it to the virgin birth of Jesus compels us to see in Isaiah 7, 14, a singular direct prediction of the virgin birth of Jesus. Hmm. And many do not think that that is compelling from the context and even from the language of Isaiah 7, 14. Well, so let's get back to, because, I, you know, every text without a context is a pretext. I've heard that for years, sure. right? So what is the context of Isaiah 7, and uh, what's going on in there that, that we might yeah. sort of understand that a little better? Yeah, yeah the context is that the, the, the northern kingdom of Israel uh, has made a coalition with the Arameans to invade Jerusalem and try to topple the Davidic king from the throne because he refuses to join them in an anti-Assyrian coalition. In the meantime, Ahaz has actually made a deal with the Assyrians to come to his aid. And God wants Ahaz to trust in him rather than to trust in military alliances and be afraid of this invasion from the north. And so offers him a sign kind of a blank check, high as heaven, deep as Sheol. And he says, I'm not going to do that. The real reason is because he's already signed on the dotted line with the king of Assyria. Oh, that's a great point. All right. And and so the word right before that is, listen, house of David, which is the king, the Davidic king and his extended family. It's Is it too little for you to weary people that you're also wearing my God? And so he's ticked off at him. And then he says, therefore, the Lord will give you a sign. Now, the word therefore, normally in prophecy, especially after a scolding, is introducing a judgment, not one of the best promises the world has ever received. And this promise is not given to Ahaz, singular. It's given to y'all, right? It's (laughs) to you all. uh, (laughs) So it's really not given to him. And and then he, again, mentions here, Hine, this take note, is saying, here is something worth paying attention to. A young woman, and I would tell you that I think you can translate this as young woman, not exclusively as virgin, although if she was not married, you would assume that she was a virgin. Mm -hmm. But it really is referring to an age category, a young woman, and actually she is described as pregnant. It is a feminine adjective, and it is followed by a participle, which could be translated as about to give birth. Mm-hmm. And in fact, it could be translated, oh, young woman, pregnant and about to give birth. And the closest parallel to this is in Genesis 16, 11, where the angel of the Lord appears to Hagar, oh, and yeah. she is very clearly pregnant says to Hagar, you're pregnant and you're going to give birth and you're going to name this child Ishmael, that is God has heard your prayer. 
So this is the closest linguistic parallel in the formulation, except it's a it's a finite verb as opposed to participle, which would be more likely to describe something that's about to happen. But it's describing a pregnant woman uh, mm. to, who's going to give birth and is going to name that child. And that child is giving tribute to God in Hagar's sense. Mm -hmm. Ishmael, God has heard me. And in terms of Emmanuel, God is with us, plural. Mm. And Ahaz doesn't care about God being with us. He's really more concerned that the Assyrian army is on his side. He doesn't <laughs> care about the usness of God's presence. But this woman, whoever she is, is confessing that she believes that God is with us, uh, even in the military crisis they're currently facing. Mm. So what happens next in the story? I mean, it's it as I recall, Isaiah says, well, or Isaiah is the prophet who's who's mediating this yeah. this speech. Yeah. Well, what, is, well, what does he is, say there? Sure. One thing that's important is the word sign that's used here is used quite frequently in the prophets, and it can be a, a supernatural sign, and it can be a natural sign. For example, in, in uh, chapter twenty, Isaiah is told to walk around the city of Jerusalem for an extended period of time, wearing less than his full set of clothing, and it's <laughs> describing him as going naked as a sign to Judah and right. the inhabitants of Jerusalem that pretty soon they're going to be carted away into exile, stripped naked and ashamed, mm. and that's called a sign. And this would be the only sign in the Old Testament that waited 700 years for its fulfillment. Because what happens right next, it says in verse 15, this child will eat curds and honey when he knows how to reject the good and to reject the bad and select the good, which could be referring to moral discernment. But it mm -hmm. also could simply refer to knowing what he likes to eat. You know, Gerber <laughs> prunes. It doesn't take too long for a baby to decide what they don't like to eat yep. because it says by the time the child is that old, the land of the two kings who are causing you a sickening dread will be abandoned. So don't yep. worry. They're not going to succeed in toppling you from the throne and destroying the kingdom of Judah. Hmm. By the time this child is old enough to distinguish between good and bad, this threat will be over. Well, it seems to beg the question. You could say in 700 years, this threat will be over. That would be um, it an is old something kid, that is more right? Yeah, yeah. It is, it's more likely. And in chapter 8, Isaiah has a son, and he names him Mershal Hashbaz. And he says, by the time he can say mama and dada, the threat will be over. So It's the, the same as the a parallel, parallel thing, There's right? a parallel between chapter 7 and 8, which you need to read together. Mm. And the implication is that this sign is going to be fulfilled that is, this birth of this child is going to launch, as, as it were, or start the clock of God. And by the time it reached uh, so many years, the threat of the enemy will be over. And it is a shorter horizon for the sign as opposed to 700 years. Yeah, there's a passage in Deuteronomy that says that uh, you'll know a true prophet from a false prophet right. when, when their prophecy comes true. Right. And And... That seems to me to imply the fact that when prophets speak, that people within their lifetime have to be able to call them into into, into accountability, right? If it's if it's a prophecy that's spoken hundreds of years later, yeah. then yeah. And, and I'm not saying that those there are not prophecies like that because I think there were, but that in this particular case, it seems to be something that within the next five or ten years takes place. Sure. So uh, scholars would date this. A particular passage around 735-734, and <clears throat> the Assyrian king that takes care of this uh, was Tiglath-Pileser, uh, whose reign was from 745 to 727. So you have about uh, mm. seven years there while he was still in control, and he would be the one who would you know, take care of Aram and nibble off at least the uh, northernmost part of the northern kingdom of, of Israel. Right. So these prophecies do come true, but they come true right. in the lifetime right. of King Ahaz. Correct. Thanks so much, Dr. Schultz, for being with us today on Exegetically Speaking. Thank you. Thanks to Silvio Vasquez, Rebecca Larson, and Krista Sanchez for helping us to produce this podcast. Thanks as well to Phil Keggy for our music. If you want to study biblical languages, the best place you could do that is Wheaton College. They have an amazing program one of the best I've ever seen, whether you want to be a graduate or an undergraduate student. 
So go to the website, www.wheaton.edu, and look for Modern and Classical Languages. Get started today. If you have questions or comments about this podcast, we'd love to hear from you. Contact us at exegetically.speaking at wheaton.edu. That's exegetically.speaking at wheaton.edu. Thanks for listening.